Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today with uh, Future Proofed. I am here with Kyle Coleman, our host, and we are going to talk about tool bloat today and the different ways that that bottlenecks GTM team. So, Kyle, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? Doing great. Excited to dive in. Good, good. And so we're going to talk about tool bloat today, uh, something that even came up internally. But before we talk about, you know, the Nathan blunder, uh, let's talk about tool bloat in general. You've been an advisor to several companies. You're a CMO here at Copy AI. Can you just give us, uh, first of all, outline what we mean when we say tool bloat, when the industry calls it tool bloat, and uh, tell us a, a time that you've seen it firsthand, a little anecdote. Sure thing, yeah. So this is something we hear from every single one of our customers that we speak to, is they come to us and they say, we don't know how this happened, but we have hundreds of applications. We have this bloated tool stack. We have application sprawl. We have this problem where we just are managing so many different point solutions that it's causing more issues than it's solving. And we can get into the issues first, but maybe we can talk more about why this happens. So I, I advise companies, I've been at companies that were grew from six people to 800 people. I, I've seen large enterprises, how they operate. And what I see over and over again, Nathan, is people inside your company have specific jobs to be done that they need to get done. And they're looking for the fastest, most efficient, most effective way to get that thing done. And the blessing and the curse of the SaaS ecosystem over the last 10 or 15 years has, there is a tool for pretty much everything. You need to take this font and add accent marks to certain ease. Like there's probably a bespoke tool just for that. And so what ends up happening is all these individuals inside the company sign up for all of these different tools that they can pay via credit card. So $20 a month here, $40 a month here, whatever it is. And one person, it sounds innocent enough, you know, this, this person needs their software for editing a podcast. Okay, cool. Let's get that. But then extrapolate that out. So if you go from being a small company to a medium-sized company, you go from a medium-sized company to an enterprise, and you maintain that ethos over time with all the needs, all the jobs to be done, all the specialists that you have, you end up with hundreds and sometimes literally thousands of tools. And it's completely out of control, again, because they're disconnected. They're point solutions. They're not speaking to or integrated with one another. And that causes the big headaches. It's not just the spend. It's not just the convoluted tech stack. It's the fact that they're not actually working together to create some sort of symbiotic environment where there's real use cases for intertwining them. And then, as you said, you get these data silos and you have all of this data that no one can actually unlock or use. It's certainly not cross departments or across departments. It becomes very hard. It becomes very hard. You would either need some sort of, and the teams that do this well, they'll have some sort of dedicated data engineering function that can try and stitch the data together to make it make sense. But more often than not, what ends up happening is you have all this data bloat. It's all this data. It's all over the place. It's really chaotic. And you basically have different versions of the truth. So the marketing team has their own set of tools or super set of tools that they have. The sales team has their own super set of tools they have. They're spitting out different metrics. They have different versions of what's happening and they end up fighting each other on what's happening instead of fighting together to achieve outcomes. And I find this interesting. I'd love to jump into your head here because you've been here um, since November, correct? About six months we're coming up on? Uh, yeah, yeah, about that. And so as, as you came in coming over from, from Clary, uh, you know, you're a leader, you pride yourself on, on both people development and process optimization. So as you're looking at our tools now internally, how do you go about deciding what's really going to give value to, let's say, like Nathan? What does Nathan need? He's been working with it, but this is kind of now bloated and causing silos. Uh, how, yeah. how do you address that when you come onto a team? I am looking to check two boxes. Well, maybe three. One, I want to be as minimally disruptive as possible to start. I'm on a fact-finding mission. I've been here four to six months. I don't want to come in and just flip the Apple card and just disrupt everybody's workflow. So minimally disruptive is, is kind of how I start to do my fact-finding. But then I want to find the second checkbox is interoperability. So I want to make sure that where possible, the tools that we do have are integrated together. The lessons we're learning, the jobs we're doing, the tasks we're running, the processes that we're automating somewhere are linked with some downstream process in some other tool or platform that we have. So that three, we're uh, minimizing spend. And that's ultimately the goal here is we want to get as much bang for our buck as possible. Uh, we're doing everything we need to do, but doing it in a cost effective way. So I'll give you an example. We or I inherited an events platform and it was a great events platform. We, we did fantastic webinars. We did a really nice job. It was intuitive. It was easy to use all the rest. However, it was not integrated with our community and we need to run events in our community. 
So we had to look at a different events platform that we could use both on our, our homepage, copy.ai homepage, as well as integrate into our customer success platform, as well as integrate it into our, our application backend. So now we can run events, quote unquote, you know, virtual trainings or events or embedded trainings or whatever all, across all of these platforms with one technology instead of potentially needing three different technologies for our marketing webinars, our community events, and our in-app type things. And so it's that kind of consolidation that I'm looking for to try and make sure that everything is as streamlined as possible from a process standpoint and an admin standpoint, as well as you know reducing the cost wherever we can. But also, once we get those integrations going, we can use the data from community to inform the type of content that we make in our webinars, the type of events. Once, once the data starts talking to each other, you start hearing really cool insights come out. That's really well said, Nathan. And then the extension of that, and this is maybe selfish for me, but I think it's the way that a lot of other uh, go-to-market leaders are thinking is I want to take that and we'll just keep using the events example because it's perfect for this. I want to take the output of those events and I want to turn it into content. If we do an event in the community, if we do an event uh, or some sort of training in our application itself, I want to take that transcript, I want to take those insights and I want to turn it into written content that we can use in marketing. We can use for email promotion, we can use for blogs, we can use for thought leadership, we can use. And that's where having some sort of connectivity into our go-to-market AI platform for us becomes a really important consideration. So that's yet another way that this flywheel approach needs to be thought of. And the point of interoperability needs to be top of mind for go-to-market leaders so that they can ensure they're really creating a useful flywheel and squeezing every ounce of value out of the efforts that they create across our go-to-market engine. Everything that you're saying makes so much sense. And yet I am seeing company after company just grab the next AI tool over and over again. Yeah. We had this today, we had this today where I wanted uh, to do something with a certain task. I wanted to perform a task, schedule social media stuff from a centralized dashboard, and then also have the reporting. And we found that one tool had better reporting and one tool let me do what I want. And I was like, well, let's just get both tools and that's fine. But again, that's not, the most effective way. We're trying to find something that can consolidate all of that. Um, why, why is this so tempting for people to just grab the shiny tool knowing it's smarter long-term to go with a more comprehensive solution? More often than not, Nathan, it's because the more senior people inside the company are disconnected from the decision to bring on said point solution. And therefore, the individual contributors who are in the trenches doing the work and getting the jobs done, and they're the ones responsible for executing this huge laundry list of things that they need to do, they're the ones making technology purchase decisions at a lot of companies. Now, more mature companies will have procurement processes and things like that that helps rein in the chaos to a certain extent, but still, it's so easy now to swipe a credit card and bring some sort of tool on that that procurement doesn't always capture everything. And so it's because at, at individual contributor or team or manager levels, they're bringing on the tools that they need to do their jobs. And the problem with that is executives don't have line of sight into the spend, nor do they have line of sight into the problem. And so the definition of the problem, therefore, is much more narrowly cast than it should be. Your, what you just talked about, the social media posting thing that we need, it, from your perspective, we just need to make sure that we're executing the right amounts of posts from our executives. And that's certainly one way of thinking about things. But as you think about your broader content strategy, that changes the paradigm because now it's not just about being able to or, or um, equipping our team for the automated scheduling and posting of that content. There's planning. There's other types of content, webinars, events, blogs, thought leadership pieces, all the rest. How is this LinkedIn strategy a pillar of a broader content marketing strategy? And that's what hopefully a more senior lens can apply to the technology adoption decisions that companies make and help everybody on their team think more holistically about what they're trying to accomplish as a team and saying, yes, we're going to be able to take care of maybe not 110% of that task, you know, with all the bells and whistles, but we can take care of 80% of that plus 80% of these 10 other things with one platform. So let's try and go with that one platform approach and automate the entire system as opposed or free up time or whatever it is for the entire system, as opposed to bringing on 10 different tools that are all the bells and whistles for every single thing under the sun. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes all kinds of sense. I'm curious, let's say I'm a leader right now and I don't even know, like, I just don't have the vision into what tools my contributors are using. 
are there signs and symptoms or do I just have to be really proactive in doing a, an audit and figuring out, like you said, those three pillars? Is it minimally disruptive? Is it interoperability with other tools? And does it minimize spend? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple pretty key indicators here. The spend is one of them. You know, you can look at your, hopefully you have a means of looking at your overall spend on whatever that you call it, tech or um, uh, tools or whatever it is as a line item in your budget. And you can see like, man, this is, this seems high. And different benchmarks exist for different companies and the way that you accrue different types of tools will be different. So I can't even give benchmarks or something like that, but start at the budget level and then line item everything out. And that forces you to do an audit where you'll say, oh, it looks like we have three different tools that could do a virtually the same thing. Like, can we make decisions about how and where to consolidate here or there? So that's one indication is how much money you're spending. I would say probably a sneakier way or maybe more of a backdoor way to do it is ask your teams what their North Star metrics are and how they're tracking those North Star metrics. Because I, you will probably find that teams have related but probably slightly different versions of the truth of what they're trying to uh, accomplish and how they're reporting on those things. And I'll, I'll give you a simple example, like website traffic, one of the most important metrics for marketing teams out there. And there's a billion different ways that you can answer this. And that depending on one little filter that you apply to your Google Analytics or your Looker Tableau dashboards or whatever it is can change everything. And so asking your team what their metrics are, A, to make sure that they're quantitatively driven, and that they're the right ones, and then B, how they measure them will tell you a lot about the way that they're getting work done. And so you can go that route. But ultimately, nothing beats a good old fashioned kind of painful process of doing a tool audit. What, what is everything we have in our stack? What is its purpose? How much are we using it? How much are we paying for it? It's an important process because every go-to-market leader is responsible for watching every single penny. You have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that your budget is well spent and you're getting the return on all of the investments that you're making across your go-to-market engine. And there's no way to really shortcut that right now. I mean, I guess you could, <laughs> ironically, bring on a vendor to do that for you or a consultant to do that for you, but that may just be fuel on the fire. Well, hey, you know what? Nothing pairs uh, better with a, a half a glass of a nice scotch than a tool on it. So they <laughs> clear out your front yeah, exactly. night, just open up the spreadsheet. <laughs> Very <laughs> romantic. <laughs> That's wonderful. All right. Uh, any other tidbits for, for go-to-market leaders on tool bloat? Identifying, fixing, solving. And then I have one last surprise question for you at the end. Think systematically. Your job as a go-to-market leader is to think in systems. Make sure that the jobs and the tasks that are to be done are not functionally siloed. Make sure that the people on your team understand how uh, task A is related to task B, how the things that you do in marketing have downstream impacts to the things in sales that then come back around and have impacts on product and therefore on marketing. So just make sure that you are thinking and, and authoring those systems and that your technology is in support of that system. And if you can think that way, that fundamentally changes the paradigm. It goes from you executing functional tasks or jobs to be done to executing go-to-market tasks or jobs to be done. And that's a very different way of thinking. And hopefully it'll help up-level your team, save you money, save you time, increase productivity, all the rest. All the good stuff. Okay. My last question. Uh, copy AI is not a tool. It's not an AI tool. It's a platform. What's the difference and why does it matter? A My definition, and people have different definitions for this, so you know it, it sort of depends. But I, a platform is more of a horizontal approach, whereas a tool is a more specific vertical approach that's purpose-built for a certain task or set of tasks. Whereas a platform has more of a horizontal capability where it can be sort of customized to complete a whole litany of tasks that exist across probably a broader set of end users. And then probably most important, the there's integrations capabilities that platforms have that many tools do not. So a true platform will offer many, many integrations, which uh, allow for much more extensibility and value delivery in other systems. So that's one thing. But the most important thing for me is inventiveness. Most tools, because they're purpose-built, are boxed in. You bring on this thing to do this specific thing, and it can do that thing. But it does that thing the same way for company A, B, C, D, E, because it's purpose-built for that. With a platform, you should have the capability for customization and for inventiveness. You have your own particular way of doing things and the platform should be able, you should be able to bend it to your will and accomplish the thing you want to accomplish the way you want to, not the way that the tool builder built their tool for you to do. And the other advantage is when you do that and you have that horizontal approach, 
all your data starts talking to each other and it gets really, really cool what you unlock the possibilities there. That's neat. No doubt. Yeah. The single pane of glass is a huge lift as well for all the reasons we just talked about. You can solve a lot of tool bloat by taking more of a platform orientation. It is, it does require a little more muscle or a little more uh, elbow grease, I should say, because the customization can be a double-edged sword where some people just want the easy solution. They want to check a box and say, we implemented this thing to solve this problem. But that may give you a lift, but it's a marginal lift and it's going to plateau. If you put in the time, energy, and effort to take the more platform orientation, the more systems orientation, and you customize something for the unique needs of your business, you're going to see an immediate and sustained lift. And that's the, that's the difference in thinking that just requires a little bit more energy, attention, focus, resources up front, but the dividends that it pays compound over time. That's the, yeah, the key word being that up front with the elbow grease right. there. As someone who's gotten addicted to workflows like they're a literal literal drug, I can say firsthand that, it's, yeah, you build a workflow and it's a little annoying at first because it takes you a little longer. But I think once we cracked that blog, uh, the transcript to blog workflow, it, the first day I saved 15 hours alone just running it twice. So You should share that workflow in the show notes so that people can take it and steal all your hard work. All right. No, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. People could take my hard work. That's fine. I, uh, yeah, I will absolutely add that in the show notes so people can get a, a look at that transcript to blog post uh, workflow. Um, people want to get it in touch with you, as always. Best place would be LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Check us out at Copy AI. Uh, check out the blog on Copy AI, too. We have this, this super high velocity means of uh, highlighting really awesome thought leadership from our executive team, from other execs that we talk to, our customers. So our, our, I, that's my call to action for the day is go to, go to our blog. That's it. You got the, the go to the blog, check out the workflow in the show notes. That's awesome. Thank you so much for listening. This is great. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Nathan.